In early February, we were at the Wisconsin Garden Expo, where I presented and we tabled. Last time we heard about gardening in a warmer, more variable environment, and this week we'll be going the other way, talking about winter gardening. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Hello and welcome to another break from our current season. I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 78 on March 8th, 2024, coming to you from the Low Tech Recording Booth. Thanks for joining us. We're still taking a break from our tour of Cooksville in 2100 to hear about how gardeners can extend their growing season into the winter. This was recorded live at the Wisconsin Garden Expo. And this is the last time I'll say not to bother following us on Twitter, X, or whatever it's called right now. We don't post there anymore, but you can still like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can buy both of our podcasts, as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, you know the spiel about advertising on podcasts. If I'm not doing the ad, someone else is getting paid. We put out all of our content for free, but if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. Supporters do get the podcast a week early. Another way to support us is to donate your used car. If you're in the U.S., contact us for details. Again, we're about to get going with the recording, but two housekeeping items first. Uh, first, this is a live recording, unedited, so the quality may be slightly less than usual. And also, the slides referenced in the talk are available on our website's blog, or can be seen if you're watching this on YouTube. Enjoy. Today, uh, I'll be talking about four season growing in Wisconsin. Um, who am I? I'm Scott. I run the Low Technology Institute. And we think a lot about how we're going to be living in the year 2100. Uh, in terms of four season gardening, uh, that might be pretty easy for us as we will be probably losing our worst month. By the year 2100, our growing season will be very different. We'll have lost our coldest month and we'll gain a new hot month in the middle. So if you like tomatoes, that's good for you. Um, and if you like keeping your plants alive through the winter, that's also good for you. Um, you know, there's obviously some negative repercussions to warming temperatures, but I'm not talking about those today. Um, yeah, so like I said, these slides will all be up on our website uh, shortly. We also have a podcast called the Low Tech Podcast, and we put that on YouTube as well as the usual podcast um, apps and places. Uh, and I'll have these slides as the background, so if you missed anything, I can listen to this all over and relive the experience. All right, today's uh, topics are uh, baseline assumptions, uh, baseline and assumptions, uh, biological adaptations, methodological adaptations, and infrastructure. Uh, so that's kind of how we're split up. Now, the first thing to think about is where are we? We are in, why are my notes not coming up? That's not good. Ah, oh, that's not good. It's okay. I have came prepared. Um, we are in DFA uh, or a cl uh, continental humid climate with a hot summer. That'd be zone 5A and 5B. That's where we are right now. Obviously, this will be changing over time, but that was my last talk. I gave a talk uh, yesterday and the day before about gardening in a warming Wisconsin, so I'm really bracketing both ends of things here. Um, so yeah, we're right there on the edge. Depending on where you came from, you might be 5A or 5B, or maybe somewhere farther afield. Welcome. Assumptions. Okay, so today, uh, I said four season gardening. I could have said winter gardening, because really, honestly, I'm not going to get too much into the summer other than how you can better prepare for fall, uh, winter, and spring gardening. Uh, so I'm going to assume that we all have some background knowledge about growing during the regular season. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I'm hoping that you might have some experience with seed starting, things like that, because sometimes I'm going to suggest experiments that are better uh, if you can start your own seeds rather than having to buy them in just for you know, economy's sake. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about extending the season into the fall, into the winter, starting earlier in the spring, or continuing from the fall straight through into the spring. Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on indoor gardening. Uh, there was, I really wish this talk had been earlier in, this, in the uh, week, uh, weekend because there were some indoor gardening talks that would have been helpful, because I'm not gonna talk about dedicated indoor gardening. I'm gonna to touch on bringing outside stuff in um, and all the bugginess that that could entail um, and fun that can be, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about starting, growing, uh, the entire life cycle of a plant indoors, although that would be a method to grow in the winter. I'm just not going to get into hydroponics or anything like that. Um, some winter crops uh, are for direct eating, others are for uh, keeping viable plants in stasis, but uh, I don't, I'm not going to get into or really talk about the, the likelihood of us starting growing and expanding uh, a lot of plants in the winter. Really, winter 
uh, and late season growing, early season growing is really just about keeping plants alive and really making your garden into an outdoor refrigerator uh, so that you can uh, take from that uh, all winter or go into the spring with incredibly large uh, uh, mature plants that then explode once the, the temperatures warm up again. So it's uh, getting a really early start. You think you're getting an early start on the season by starting your seeds now? Imagine if you had started them in August, right? Like that's going to be a lot, a lot more uh, if you can keep them alive through the winter. Um, so a lot of the information and Im uh, images will come from books that will be listed at the end of the publication. Again, publication will be on our website tomorrow morning on our blog. Um, so a couple caveats. So we like to talk about full sun. Well, remember full sun in the winter is like five hours, which is not really full sun. And it's a glancing sun, right? Like, so the, the, the angle of the sun is going to be putting out less watts per square meter or however you want to measure it. Uh, so there's just less sunlight. So that's why we're really not talking about putting on growth in the winter. We're going to be keeping things alive. They're going to put on their growth in the fall and then hopefully just maintain that through winter. Um, even if cold hardy, the plants really aren't putting on a lot of green growth in the winter. So you're just keeping your cabbage and your Brussels sprouts. Um, winter hardy varieties are slow growing. They're often short, stubby, and they have a lot of dry matter. Why is that? Well, dry matter doesn't freeze. If you have really leggy, tall, quick growing plants, so you put on a lot of uh, nitrogen fertilizer, for example, uh, those will freeze a lot easier and they're not going to survive uh, into the winter months. Um, so they're Problem is, these types of varieties are um, not as economically viable. They don't grow as fast. So there's not as much market for them. So you have to kind of look around. Uh, Seed Savers is one place, Bakers. Uh, there's a couple others that have these specialized varieties that are a little slower growing um, and are for the kind of specialized uh, winter market. I always recommend people do A-B testing. Now, if you've never tried to keep something alive through the winter, then you're just doing A testing. I guess B testing would just be letting it die. Uh, but A-B testing means do what you usually do and then do half uh, of what you're doing a new way. And then you can see, does this do better than the way I've done it before? Uh, or not, because a lot of times I have people, I grow a lot of potatoes, I've done a lot of potato research for a small scale, and folks will come up to me and say, oh, last year I grew my potatoes like this and it worked out great. I said, okay, compared to what? Well, just great. I'm like, well, okay, maybe it was a great season and you could have just thrown potatoes in a pile of leaves and they would have done great, right? So you need to have that comparison. And so I really encourage people, anytime you're taking on a new method or a new idea or even a new plant variety, do A-B testing. Do what has worked for you in the past and then try something new next to it and see which one works better for you and then take the winner of that and do more A-B testing. Or if you're really into it, do A, B, C, D, E, F testing, you know? Uh, but uh, that way you're likely to get something that you've had success with before or, or maybe you'll find something new that works better uh, with less risk of losing everything if, you're B, if you just try the new thing and it fails. Um, and saving your seeds. Again, I'm coming at the tail end of the Garden Expo, but there's a lot of resources out there for you to uh, be able to learn to save seeds. Uh, take notes. Um, I am going to develop, I came up with this product in my last talk. Um, I'm coming up with a garden calendar or a garden, um, a notebook for you. And it's going to be perfectly tailored for the garden note taker. Half of the book is going to be March, April, May. And then the last little bit of the book, a couple of pages is going to be July, August, September, because that's exactly how much garden notes we take. We're all very good note takers in the first three months of the gardening season. And then in the last couple of months, you can put it on a postcard. <laughs> Um, guilty also. So, um, but it is important to save your seeds uh, with notes so that you know, oh, we had a really hard winter, we had a really easy fall, we had you know, a really wet fall, um, so that you know which varieties are working better for you in these different conditions. Not that we can necessarily predict, is this going to be a wet uh, and warm uh, fall and winter, or is it going to be a dry and cold one? We, don't, we can't predict that, but what we can do is if we know we have you know, hot or cold, wet or dry, there's only four real options that you're dealing with. And so if you have four varieties that you plant going into the winter with knowing that three of them are likely going to die or possibly going to die or do not as well as the one, uh, you're going to get something to survive the winter. Um, and if you're saving your own seeds, that doesn't cost you very much, right? Because the seed cost is essentially just your own time, which is invaluable. I know all of our time is invaluable. Um, all right, I don't get paid by the hour anymore. I don't get, uh, let's not get into that. Okay, specific varieties. So before I put up the next slide, and I see you all pull out your cell phones and take pictures. I have these, what's on this next slide, as a handout. I probably have enough for everybody. Otherwise, it's going to be 
at our booth or online, so deep breath. There's gonna be a whole bunch of varieties here. You don't need to memorize them. Whoa. Yeah, that's why, like I said, these are on the website. I prepared you and I still got an O, okay. Um, so yeah, <laughs> these are just a, a collection of suggested from various winter gardening sources of varieties that do well um, in the winter in cold weather. They have their approximate temperature gradients, and this doesn't mean that's the temperature your thermometer says. That means that's the temperature in the bed where it's living, and we're gonna talk about how we can you know, uh, really try and save ourselves with the mechanical stuff later on. We're still talking about varieties. So these are some of those that, uh, if you can find them, uh, are likely to do a little bit better. Again, I have a handout, so don't worry. Uh, I'm gonna move away from this now. <laughs> Did anyone get them all written down? No, okay. Um, See me afterwards if you did, you're gonna be a speed reading champion. Okay, a um, couple of warnings when we start talking, and we're gonna talk about methodological adaptations. So, whatever you do, start slow. Don't say, I'm gonna winterize my entire garden, and, I, and you spend thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours your first year. Try a better two, right? Like, try, work up to this. Um, I don't take that advice, but I should. No, um, I'm getting better at taking that advice as I get. Um, and also think about uh, how you eat and what you eat. Raw veggies have a lot more nutrients, so think about planting things for the winter that are going to be uh, more easily eaten uh, raw or at least close to raw. Things like spinach, kale, lettuce um, are, are often better, better choices than things that need a lot of preparation where you're gonna lose a lot of those nutrients, right? Because you're gonna be getting lettuce of them, but you're gonna be getting some greens in the winter, which is nice. Um, Again, let me stress again, you expect very little growth in the winter. We're converting our garden into basically storage space and stasis for plants rather than uh, somewhere that's gonna put on a lot of green leafy growth in the winter. Just not, we just don't have the solar uh, energy. So um, one thing that we can do, think about your soil. Uh, soil drainage is a big factor. Low, low spots collect water and cold air. And so if you have a well-drained soil, um, it can uh, keep plants from suffocating, uh, their roots from suffocating as, uh, as that water pools and accumulates and doesn't get uh, transpired or moved around by the usual processes that are at play in the summer. Um, and you can get rotting in your roots and then the plant dies. Uh, so you could go as far as installing drain tile or a raised bed with a good draining soil, uh, maybe picking four beds or so that you're going to convert into your winter beds and, and putting a bit of an investment into having a well-drained soil there. Um, or I had a, a person in a previous talk who lived on sand, so she's already set, but then she has to try and build up nutrients anyway, so that's a different kettle of fish. Um, sand already drains well. It warms and cools really quickly, which can be a detriment in the winter if it cools too quickly. Um, but if it's cooling without moisture in it, it's less detrimental to the plants than freezing solid with lots of moisture in there. Silt or clay loam, like what I'm on is, is clay, uh, is slower to warm, but also slower to cool. So you'll get a bit of attenuation into the fall, but it does drain poorly. So I try and grow on top of that. Dark soil obviously absorbs and maintains heat better. So dark mulch, I'm a big uh, mulch fan, uh, is, a, is, a, is an option that can help uh, push the season a little farther if you have that dark mulch rather than straw, which is light colored and bounces a lot of, um, of solar radiation off. Obviously we wanna build up a large hummus layer um, that's aerated, pH stable, it'll hold a more even temperature, nutrient dense. I mean, it's not rocket science to say, the better your soil is, the, more your, the better your plants are gonna do. Um, so we're all working towards that anyway. Um, so yeah, compost, 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 uh, as much as, okay. So what does good soil, well-drained soil look like? Uh, it's loose and has good growth, growth, but not the type that has uh, jumping worms go through it. Uh, that's not the type of looseness that I'm talking about. Um, I did a vermicompost talk and everyone's asking me about vermicompost or about uh, jumping worms which thank goodness I luckily I don't have experience with but I know others have and it sounds pretty nasty um bright soil color not dull we all yeah we've seen that bright healthy looking soil uh looks like it's uh very happy that dull uh sheen on it is really frustrating um earthworms insects are in it although in the winter they're all going to go down and become dormant Water obviously uh, drains well through well-drained soil. It's kind of self-fulfilling uh, there. Um, you really want that moist, cakey type of uh, feel rather than a, uh, uh, a sodden uh, sponge or anything like that. Crumbly texture and a balanced pH. Again, gold standard, we can't get everything. Um, so 
Soil nutrients, again, composting, building up the soil's nutrients is more important in winter, and it's also important going into the winter. So in that fall, you don't want to throw on a ton of nitrogen. You don't want to build up a lot of green leafy growth that has a lot of vascular tissue that's going to hold a lot of water because that water freezes and can help kill the plant more quickly. So it's a balanced, slow growing approach. Slow and steady will win the race in the winter. Uh, manure is okay. Uh, evaluate your source, obviously. Um, I get a lot of manure from a, a local horse stable. Uh, again, you don't want to over apply that nitrogen, go for a balance. That too much quick growth in the fall, like I said, weakens the stems, they die slow and steady. Say it again. Um, cover crops, particularly clover, I like clover, uh, is easier to cut and work into the soil than cover crops used with bigger equipment. So there's a lot of winter rye, stuff like that. Well, perfectly fine. If you've been doing that and it's working for you, great. I like clover because you can just kind of turn it right in uh, to the soil. Um, and I put that in a lot of my beds. I wouldn't necessarily be trying to overwinter this, but this is a good... Uh, uh, a thing to toss into beds before they go to sleep in the winter. Clover will do fairly well in pretty cold temperatures anyway. Um, so mulch, big fan of mulch. If you were at any of my talks yesterday, I probably spent half the time talking about mulch. Uh, straw can insulate, but like I said, straw will bounce a lot of the sun off the soil. So straw isn't necessarily the best bet. Uh, dark mulch, which can absorb heat and regulate moisture, but I'm not talking about wood chips. Wood chips will s uh, sap a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. Although if you're applying a lot of nitrous fertilizer, maybe that would be, no. Uh, generally speaking, wood chips will uh, sap too much nitrogen out of the soil and aren't as good. Uh, but a dark vegetative uh, mulch can be really helpful. It absorbs heat, it regulates moisture, because even though we're in the middle of winter, you're still on a warm day, every couple of weeks, you're still gonna want a garden, uh, gar uh, water. And I'll get to irrigation here in a minute. Um, oops, sorry, it's a little more, oops. Uh, root vegetables can be heavily mulched for overwintering. So instead of storing your carrots in your basement in a pile of sand, like I do, uh, you can actually, if you can keep the ground from freezing, you can mulch them pretty heavily um, and then go through and dig them in the winter on warm days. Um, for, or you can be trying to overwinter uh, a few uh, carrots for seeds the next year because they'll take a, a year and a half to seed. Um, too much sawdust or wood chips, again, saps nitrogen from the soil. You are best, uh, your best bet is to apply mulch before the ground freezes. Once the ground freezes, it, mulch will just keep it frozen longer. So you want to get that mulch on there uh, in, earlier in the fall. And so uh, obviously mulch uh, is an organic adjunct and will break down and add uh, nourishment to your soil, it suppresses weeds, which I'm going to get to here in a minute, regulates moisture and temperature, prevents erosions, all great things uh, that we want to be looking for in the winter. Um, siting and microclimates. So again, my, my small joke here is that uh, microclimates would be what I would call a kid's laser tag zone if I were going to open one. Uh, but micro zones can be created but with as little as a stone wall uh, or other infrastructure, plants, uh, trees, things like that in your garden. Uh, they can bump up your gardening zone, uh, a zone or even two if you're, depending on how you're doing it. So uh, right now we're in 5A, but if I put this stone wall running east to west in my garden in front of it, that might be, you know, six or maybe even seven and behind it might be a four. Right? And so for the winter, obviously, we're going to want to be growing in front of it uh, because that's going to help maintain and radiate that, that the few sunny days we've had lately. Uh, uh, but it'll help radiate that heat and maintain that heat uh, into the bed. South facing slopes, beds south of a building, walls, or even uh, an arbor vitae uh, can give a little bit extra sun and temps through the winter. Um, and protection from northern winds. So even like uh, sometimes old farm buildings would be built uh, around a central uh, yard and that central yard would be protected on multiple sides to help uh, keep it a little extra warm in that, in that little patio area um, and that could be a good gardening spot. Um, and then there's of course, you know, using valleys or um, larger scale topography to site your plant. Um, hedges are great, but they're really slow to mature. So if you were putting hedges along the north, uh, uh, a north edge of a growing space, um, that's great, but uh, it may take a, a little while. Walls are good. Um, although actually hedges are better in some ways because uh, walls will create a backdraft and it will actually drop, if it's a cold north wind, it can drop a lot of snow and cold uh, right after that wall and create a circulation. Whereas a little bit of air passing through uh, makes less of a low pressure zone. And so the winter wind can actually blow off of those crops. So uh, it's, it's nice if you can get a little bit of pass through on those walls that are preventing those cold north winds from coming in. Um, also think about cold air kind of like uh, water. 
right? It sinks into low spots and will sit there. So if you have uh, a completely solidly fenced yard and it gets full of cold air coming in from the north, uh, it can just be held in there, whereas if you let that cold air seep out on the southern side, uh, you might, you're gonna be better off. So, so for example, this is my backyard um, in my garden, and these are kind of like my microclimates. And the way that uh, I did this is, well, one way, uh, which is kind of nice right now, and especially for winter gardening, this is applicable, go into your garden, ah, we're, most of us have, at least in my garden, the snow is pretty much gone, but if we get a snow and then we get a sunny day, Walk through there a few times and watch where the snow melts first. Where the snow melts first are good spots, potential spots for winter garden beds because those are getting the most sun. For some reason that snow is melting off of there faster. Um, those are really great spots to be thinking about your winter beds. In the summer, things might be slightly different because the leaves will have uh, leafed out on the trees. But for me, what I did in the summer for my different microclimates was I looked, um, I went out every hour on the hour and I marked where had sun. So each one of these is how many hours of sun. And so I have my hot spots, I have my cool spots, um, and I plant accordingly. Like right here behind my, this is north over here, this is south down here. Right here behind my house, uh, I have probably zone seven. It's uh, protected by the garage and then trees and then trees and it's a nice really warm uh, growing space so I can grow some pretty southern stuff there. Uh, in the winter it's also pretty nice. Um, and then yeah, it, it varies through the yard. But you can do this with yourself. Uh, if we get another good blanket of snow and then a warm sunny day, walk through and look where melts first um, and that can uh, be a, a good guide for you. <laughs> so every variety is different. Um, some need to be mature before they freeze. Others need to be mostly done with growth. Um, others can be really small and make it through the winter. It depends on the garden, or it depends on the um, on, on the variety. And um, so you're gonna want to time your fall plantings just like you carefully fall your uh, time your spring planting so that you have a appropriate amount of growth. A lot of things like cabbages uh, and Brussels sprouts you'll wanna have pretty much fully grown by the time it starts to freeze real hard if you want to be picking mature, because they're not gonna put on any more growth. If you're trying to get your starts going for the spring already in the fall and you just want them to get mature enough, um, that's a different story. They don't have to be quite as big. All right, I have what's on the next slide, also on the handout, so you don't have to freak out. Um, so this is from Territorial. Your results may vary, um, but this is a good place to start. Uh, this is a really great chart of stuff to start going into the winter, when you could start it, um, how large you want it to get before you're transplanting. Um, it has frost hardiness. It has all kinds of useful information on here. So worth uh, having a, a start here and then modify according. Um, it doesn't have dates on here because it's kind of uh, space agnostic. I mean, I guess it does have dates, but we can shift these uh, depending on where you are. Uh, it, it'll take trial and error because your backyard, your garden space might be a slightly warmer one than your neighbors, right? So you, it's, it's very individualistic. All right. Beds, um, you need to space them out a little bit more in the winter. Uh, you can't have as much tight spacing as you can get away with in the summer just because the solar resources are so much uh, less. And also you want to encourage large roots, um, which will help support them through the winter. Raised beds are a great option because raised beds have frames that you can attach things to uh, because you know, love to accessorize uh, for the winter. Uh, and for our purposes, accessories are things like row covers that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. But having that raised bed framework is really helpful for attaching things to. Also keeps you from walking on them. Uh, they're often better drained. So raised beds are a great candidate, um, all things being equal, for your winter beds rather than in-ground. I mean, in-ground's great. You can do a lot with in-ground, but uh, raised beds are a little more easy to work with. Easier to work with. Okay, weeds and pests. So this, we're not just, you know, it's not just gonna be your cabbage that lives through the winter because you're gonna make this little microbiome for them to live in. Uh, we're gonna have, or a micro zone, uh, we're gonna have a great environment for weeds and pests to go through the winter too, hooray, hooray. Um, so this is in one of my, I call them pods. Uh, one of my little, uh, obviously, uh, I needed to weed that before the winter, um, and I hadn't opened this in months, and I popped it open, I'm like, oh crap, uh, and all of my cabbages, and these cabbages were, these were not for eating in the winter, these were cabbages to start. So like when I start in, when I weeded this, and then I started these, you know, that's a pretty good start for, you know, April, or, or I guess um, March, right? But they're all ready to go in December, and then they made it through the winter, and then boom, I had really big, nice cabbages really early in the year. Um, because I wasn't, these weren't for winter eating, these were for spring starts. Um, but yeah, 
The weeding here was abysmal. I don't know. I have to get my assistant on that. Um, what's that? Yeah, um, that's coming up in just a few slides. Yeah, that's that's the big thing is the, the ro dust is a protect. Oh, the weeds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Pests should be evaluated with an integrated pest management. You want to go into the winter with as few pests as possible. I mean, that's true anytime, right? No, we don't want to leave them around. But you want to be have a plan uh, or do some research and come up with a plan to try out that year. Um, as we have less uh, severe winters, that's more time in the summer and the fall for our pests to proliferate and to... Um, <laughs> Weaken our plants going into the winter. If you've had a lot of pest trouble, you might, you, you, if they've been weakened by pests, you might just as well harvest them uh, rather than try and get them to th go through the winter. You want to cull and have only the healthiest plants going into the winter. Um, geographic ranges are going to expand. Um, I found in my research recently that contrary to what I had thought, which is, uh, oh, the colder a winter it is, the more likely it is to kill a lot of bugs, uh, a lot of pests in the ground. And that actually, studies have been shown that that's not the case because the, the insects get down, the pests get down low enough that 20 below doesn't really affect them. Um, it's a slow, damp, cool spring when the fungus wakes up and the fungus goes out and eats lots of dormant insects before they can emerge. So it's actually a cool, slow, damp spring that will bring down some pest, some pest load uh, rather than a severely cold winter. Although I guess you can have some winter kill. Um, harvesting, eat the worst looking ones first. So if you have a row of 20 cabbages, pick the one that's not looking as good as the others. You want to leave the best looking ones, unless you're having like, you know, the Pope over. I don't know who do you have over. I don't know. Uh, you, then you then you can pick him a good cabbage to feed the Pope. Uh, but yeah, if you're if, all things being equal, pick the the less good looking ones. The longer ones or the 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 best looking ones will last longer. Um, so yeah, this is my little. This is my. He's almost five now. Um, but yeah, we were just picking some of our uh, fall vegetables. Don't harvest the plants um, if it's below freezing. Uh, many of these plants can be perfectly fine outside while it's freezing, but then don't bring them and put them in the fridge for a few days before you cook them. Pick them right before you're going to cook them. If you bring them in and let them thaw uh, rapidly, they're going to disintegrate, right? So you want to pick them and then eat them. Um, or pick them when it's above freezing, you know, when it's slowly come above freezing. Uh, or you can preserve it. So don't be fooled by appearances, especially with cabbage. Cabbage can have some pretty nasty looking outer leaves, but yeah, peel back a couple and inside you might find a pretty good head. Okay, so uh, don't be put off by appearances. Uh, do a little digging and, you know, uh, understand that this is produce that's been out for months out in the field, right? So it's not going to be supermarket quality because they'll call that stuff. But it's perfectly edible, perfectly safe as long as you follow standard practice. And stay positive. Don't be hard on yourselves. People don't garden in the winter a lot for a reason. Uh, it's not necessarily easy. And there's, if you get a nasty winter, you know, you're, you might be out of luck. If you end up having a light winter, you could do particularly well. So those things, unless, unless you control the weather, in which case, please come talk to me. Um, if, <laughs> if you don't control the weather, you can't control the weather. And if you have a bad winter, it's, it's you know, stay positive. Um, look at it as an experiment, right? This is, go into it as a, experiment and remember that negative results are still results. If something didn't work one year, well, maybe try something else the next year. Um, okay, so infrastructure. Yay, this is one of my favorites because you get to talk about stuff you can put in and on your garden. Um, so we've already prepped our soil. We've picked good varieties. So we're already, you know, started early enough in the year that they're all good uh, eating, harvesting quality or big enough at least to make it through for the spring. So now talk about protecting. So don't overuse infrastructure too much in the fall. Right, so if I'm putting row covers on and getting everything nice and toasty in September, October, well then my plants, they become weak. Right, like I, they might think, oh, this isn't September, this isn't October, this is oh, August and you know September. I'm gonna put on lots of growth, this is still early enough in the season and then when it gets really cold, they're like, oh, why is it December all of a sudden? So let them start to cold, just like you uh, harden off your spring plant outs, you need to kind of harden off your winter plant outs. Let them get into cold. Uh, if it's, you know, a light frost on your cabbage, that's not going to kill them. Let them get that a couple of times to kind of start to acclimatize them. And then as it starts getting colder, then start adding these things to them to keep them uh, to, to, you're basically just trying to trim those extra cold temperatures off them rather than protect them uh, like a helicopter gardener uh, the entire winter. Um, and also be careful on sunny, mild days, right? You have a, 
well, this year, what? Like, what was it, 75 on Christmas? I don't remember, but it was warm. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty warm. So you don't wanna have all these row covers on and then you have a rogue 60 degree day in December and then you bake all your plants. Uh, my first winter where I overwintered a lot of cabbage, I lost so much of my started cabbage for the next spring because it was a hot day and I forgot. Um, and I ran out there in the evening, I was like, oh no, and I pulled it up and it just smelled like melted cabbage because uh, it all just wilted. It was like too hot uh, and it all died. So uh, make sure to ventilate and remove on those rogue hot days, which we're getting more of it seems like. Um, also you want to avoid, another warning, avoid cross ventilation. So when we look at row covers, which are long kind of tubes, if you keep both ends open, uh, you might get a wind passing through there and that's just gonna suck the heat right out. Um, you want to keep um, ventilation slow and seeping rather than blowing uh, or moving quickly because that pulls too much um, heat or even uh, uh, coolness away from the plants. And don't forget to water. They're still alive, right? So they still need to be watered. Um, and when you have an impermeable cover, I'll show some row covers that are plastic, um, you'll need to water under them, especially on a warmer day where it's fine to be opening them up. Um, the bigger the cover, uh, the better it needs to be secured against the wind. I was two miles north of that tornado. <laughs> you know, the, our, I mean, why should I be surprised? It's February, there should be tornadoes. Um, <laughs> but you wanna have everything, maybe not against a tornado, because what can you do? Uh, but you wanna have uh, those you know, winter winds are pretty brutal, so make sure that they are well secured. Um, and remember that everything that admits light also loses heat at night through radiation. So if you have a lot of clear stuff to get that, e that extra little light uh, into your plants, make sure that you also are covering it back up at night with something that insulates a little bit to keep that in. All right, so let's talk about some specific things. A cloche. Uh, these were, there were millions of these around Paris uh, at the turn of the last century, and they would, uh, these are tiny little bell-shaped covers that go on individual plants or in gr groups of small plants. So if you can, if you can afford these antique, beautiful glass, <laughs> do, do some folks have these? A couple, no? They're harder to find and they're expensive. Um, but you know what, <laughs> I have a lot of these. Um, and you can make, and these are nice because they have a little bit of ventilation built in. Um, uh, you can make them out of basically anything. And these are just little bells that will keep a little extra heat. And now these, of course, will be propped open uh, on hot days. They have cloche, uh, uh, you can just put like a little piece of wood, tip them up, um, just so that they get a little bit more ventilation on hot days so that they don't fry in there. Um, you can use cones. I've even seen people use those old like uh, the dog cones from when after the dog has a surgery. I've seen people use those things. I don't know why you'd have a lot of those, but <laughs> maybe you're a veterinarian, I don't know. Uh, these are Dutch lights. Dutch lights are temporary wooden frames and they support glass panes. Um, they're higher in the north. I mean, this is a double pane, um, but they're higher in the north generally and lower on the south side. Um, they can be DIY. And this isn't something that's gonna keep, you know, 20 below uh, cabbage alive because it's glass, but it will give you a couple weeks or maybe even a month or two uh, on the shoulder seasons. Um, and you know, these can be made from uh, uh, storm windows, things like that. You know, if you have a friend in the trades, um, I have a friend in the trades and he's constantly texting me, do you need more storm windows? I'm like, no, please stop asking me. I have a thousand and a half of them. So uh, with the caveat though, it's glass. And I always warn you, anytime you put something glass in your garden, there's a reasonable chance it's going to get broken. And you might have to be dealing with glass shards in your garden. So just buyer beware on that. If you have the money for plexiglass or something like that, go for it. Um, but for my uh, let's say very cost effective <laughs> gardening, uh, AKA cheap, uh, those glass panes are pretty, pretty uh, effective. Cold frames, the uh, more grown up cover, uh, cousin of uh, Dutch lights. Uh, you can DIY these with storm windows or full windows, hinge along one side to create an A-frame, uh, or you can do it where you're building the sides out of another material you can do it out of. Um, straw bales, you can do boxes like this, you can build little tiny greenhouses. These are all, could be classified as cold frames, right? These are built into the side of a house, which is great. It's getting all of this thermal mass that's storing heat energy during the day. Also, it's shared with the house, so it's, you know, radiating a bit of heat. And then here are some, yeah, these are cement, cement on the back to absorb heat and release it at night. Um, those look like permanent uh, built-in ones, yeah, so you can, um, go nuts, uh, but they should hug the ground 
The higher they are, the more the heat can rise away from the plants. You really only want them high enough to cover the plants uh, for your best performance. Hotbeds. Hotbeds are artificially warmed soil on a bed of compost. And these have kind of fallen out of favor in industrial production. Back in the day, so this is a picture from France, um, they used to do uh, hotbeds all the time because they didn't have ready access to, say, natural gas to heat up a greenhouse, which is what we do now, because uh, we'd just rather burn the fossil fuel rather than use you know, all this horse manure that's just going to waste. Uh, back then, there were a lot more horses, there was a lot more horse manure, um, but they would pile up 18 or so inches of horse manure uh, at the beginning, and it would be semi-anaerobic, so it would be slow to compost, but you don't want 160 degrees underneath your plants because it'll burn them. Um, but hotbeds are essentially a layer of soil laid on top of a <coughs> container of manure, a thick layer of composting manure. Uh, so you could do 12 to 14 inches for beds um, that are gonna last through the winter or maybe a little more depending on your um, locations. You can also build them above ground, but then there's less insulation. You can lose a lot of heat out of the sides. Um, some people do their starts on compost beds. That, that's a certainly a, a useful way to do it, uh, a, a second use of compost because it has all that heat. Here we have one that's surrounded by straw and then inside is the manure um, that's got covers on it. So these are all useful ways to do a hotbed. Um, you wanna make sure you have a good layer of soil because if you're using manure, it's gonna have potential for bacterial transmission to leafy greens, especially if you're eating leafy greens in a more raw state, you might not want to do that from a hotbed just out of an abundance of caution. My lawyers tell me I have to say that. What you do in your own house is up to you, but I'm telling you, do not eat leafy greens from a hotbed because you might get E. coli. I've said it, now you do it and you get sick, it's on you. Okay, good, we're all clear. My lawyer's happy, my, my, my wife's. Uh, she's like, be careful what you say. You're telling people to do it. No, no, I'm careful, okay. Um, yeah, plants need to be watered. Think about this, there are extra heat in there, so they're gonna need a little more water than you think. Water around midday on a warm day. Um, you can combine these, of course, as pictured here with cold frames, Dutch lights, row covers, etc. You can even make a custom-built greenhouse, and I'll show you at the end here, a custom-built greenhouse um, to hold these. Row covers, this is a pretty good and a approachable way to extend your season. Row covers, uh, also called horticultural fleece, egg fabric, et cetera. There's a lot of different names for these. You can find them in grower catalogs. Uh, they're not as common in household gardening catalogs, but they should be. Um, these row covers are a life -saver. I use tons of them. Uh, here are some of mine, for example. One of the first years I did this, um, I used bent, uh, that's EMT, electrical medical, meta, uh, metal conduit, uh, bent into horseshoes and then put over cabbages and things and lots of weeds apparently. This was my first year doing it. Um, and then I covered them up here um, with multiple layers of this fabric and they lived all winter long. They made it through pretty easily. Um, and you can adjust them. I, this was one brain uh, storm I had of doing, so you can see piled up mulch on the back to blow uh, cold northern winds off of it, dark color, and then I had open, I would open them up in the morning when I go open up the chickens, if it was gonna be a reasonable temperature, they'd get some sunlight, and then I'd close them up at night. And this is uh, the the white, fa it's it's like a horticultural fleece or ag fabric, it's what the, it's row covering um, in for market gardeners. Um, it's, yeah, it's just like a kind of a fleecy white, yeah, yeah, it's like a woven feeling. Yeah, it's permeable, it breathes, um, but slowly. And then, yeah, I had uh, clear poly in front, um, and that worked really well. The kale, the kale uh, did, survived all winter, and I was just harvesting all winter, and this was it, and this was it in the spring. Uh, it survived pretty well. Um, others you can use more permeable or more uh, robust covers uh, going into the winter. This was just to kind of keep it alive through the winter. Um, worked really well. So yeah, different, different ways. Uh, so this is a good diagram to kind of show what I'm doing. Um, different ways to do it. Uh, so they're using those horseshoes uh, to also keep as a wind barrier, right? To keep the wind from blowing the horticultural fleece away. Um, they sell clips that fit right onto half inch EMT. Um, some people use PVC. I recommend, I, I think the PVC becomes too brittle. Um, even if it's bent already, once it gets to 20 below and then gets hit by a hard wind, they can shatter. I haven't had that happen to my EMT. I don't, wanna, I don't want to be in the winter storm that crushes my uh, metal conduit. Uh, that would be pretty nasty. Um, yeah, so they use these kind of clips, but you can also buy little plastic clips that hold on, uh, special made for that. Um, you could do a couple of layers. You could do uh, one layer here and then put more 
uh, pi a slightly larger piping and then another layer, then you'd get an air layer between them. That'd be really good. Uh, yeah, so row covers are great. Poly tunnels are also nice. And these don't have to be a big high hoop house that you invest in. These can be, you can just get, um, what's it called? Uh, bu 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 bu. It is the tension wire for, uh, so if you go to Menards or any other store that sells chain link fence, there's something called tension wire. It comes in these big spools and it's pretty big gauge galvanized wire. And then you can just cut through it and then bend them out. And then you have these pretty strong enough hoops of galvanized wire that you can then use like this to make little hoop houses. And then you can get um, different types of plastic through uh, ag suppliers for market gardeners or things like that. And then you can make these small polytunnels. And you don't have to go nuts. Like this is a market gardener, right? That's their job. This is, a li I'm not <laughs> suggesting that you all go do this this winter, but you can do it on a small scale. You can make a small one. Um, uh, to keep things going a little longer. And then you can add on to that, right? These, it doesn't have to be just one thing. So you can have this during the day and then you pull a row cover, cover over it at night. Um, so it does take more work, but you can certainly get a lot out of it. And if it's not getting sunny, you don't have to uncover them and just leave them be. Uh, walls and terraces, this is a bit more of a infrastructure if you want to go for it. Um, but you know, if this was facing the south, this would be a really warm growing environment and you could build little covers and stuff into these uh, infrastructure things. So just, just part of the built environment of your garden. Uh, greenhouses. Now, obviously a greenhouse is quite an investment. This is my greenhouse. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Uh, this is the, uh, it's called the Jewel Box. It's in St. Louis. It was built for the 1904 World's Fair so that they could bring up all kinds of uh, uh, tropical plants and things. Um, my wife and I actually got married in that. Um, we saved a ton on buying flowers because it's full of flowers. Um, and it's beautiful. Uh, so uh, they were actually invented in Roman times. Uh, Emperor Tiberius needed cucumbers for medical reasons. Uh, uh, and Pliny the Elder talks about how they created a greenhouse to grow cucumbers in Rome uh, uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, the 1200s in the Vatican, they kept getting gifts from across Christendom, and so they built a greenhouse. 1400s Korea, they built um, greenhouses with heated wooden or heated ondel uh, stone floors that they'd light a fire and it would pass the smoke through the floor and it would heat up. Really cool. Uh, but they weren't really widespread um, outside of uh, royal or very wealthy um, environments until the 1600s in Europe uh, for market gardens. And, uh, and so it's a big investment. And these are obviously commercial, like for market gardeners or folks who are doing this as their job. Um, but you can get pretty small uh, economical uh, greenhouses. And even in the greenhouses, I still have to cover my plants, right? Uh, but I get an extra month on either side of the growing season real easy. Um, and yeah, it, it adds, then I only have a couple of months that I need to gap with extra measures inside. And there are things you can do, like uh, insulation. Um, plastic glazing isn't a real good insulator, even though my high tunnel will get up to like the 70s when it's even like 35 degrees outside. Uh, at night, it gets down just as cold as everything else because all that heat gets lost as radiation. So if I covered it, uh, it would keep a lot of that in. Uh, you can have a double wall active blower. This is a bit of an expensive thing where you have two layers of plastic and there's a blower keeping an air pocket in there. That provides quite a lot of insulation. Um, you can add thermal walls. So these are big black, um, contain uh, big black metal containers full of water on the southern, excuse me, northern wall of uh, more climate controlled, controlled greenhouse. But these absorb solar radiation all day. And then at night they release that heat back and they will just really, if the temperatures are going like this, you know, uh, it will just kind of smooth them out a bit. Um, you can do a manure composting and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna show you this one later on. But basically this whole back northern wall, these are, each one of these is a cubic yard uh, container for horse manure. And that's producing a lot of heat that is then circulating through blowers into this. It's a really cool greenhouse. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, then there's things like active heating. So this is a mass heater that all, uh, you fire it here and then all the smoke goes through all of this ma masonry before it leaves. And that deposits a lot of the heat. So the, the temperature coming out of here is like 120 degrees. So that means all those BTUs are staying in the greenhouse. Uh, you could do something like an earth tube. The earth stays constant. Uh, if you get down far enough, and if you have a long enough pipe and a blower, you can be blowing 55 degree air in uh, for the cost of just running a blower motor uh, all winter long. Uh, grow indoors. Again, I'm not really gonna get too deep into this, but if you're already heating your house, which most of us do, um, you could be gardening in there, or you could be growing something, or at least keeping things alive. I have a lot of stuff in my root cellar that I bring in, like figs. Um, I keep my citrus in, my southern windows are basically 
chock a block with plants right now, uh, citrus and things like that. Um, you could also do things like microgreens uh, for a lot of the same green nutritional stuff. Especially if you're saving your own seeds, you have a surplus of seeds that you can eat. Um, potted plants, yeah, keep those southern windows full. I'm not gonna get into like real hydroponic or anything where you're starting and keeping it inside forever, but these, there's a lot of really uh, pretty options out there uh, that are nicer than what I have. Well, they're getting nicer because my wife says, can you make this look a little nicer? I like all the green, but it's, uh, I don't wanna feel like I'm living outside. All right. So now let's turn, let's see, what, what time am I done? I'm, I got 50, okay, good. So I'll get through a couple of case studies and we'll have time for questions or discussions. Maybe folks here have some other suggestions. Uh, so these are case studies. These are more like eh, kind of inspiration rather than uh, go out and do it right now, uh, unless you want to, which would be really cool. Let me know if you do, because I'd love to share uh, what you do. Anyway, so, uh, so these are Chinese greenhouses. These were developed in the 1980s. Um, and these have had various iterations over the years, but basically they're all kind of the same idea. They have a masonry or a soil rammed earth back northern wall that absorbs heat during the day. I guess these more so. And then they have this kind of half an arch going forward. And then what these look like are, uh, they're, they're large and they grow tons of green leafy vegetables all winter uh, for cities in China. Um, there's uh, yeah, they have these, they mass produce these arch lattice covers, uh, and then they're covered with, uh, fat, uh, what do you call it, uh, greenhouse uh, film. And then at night, they have rice straw mats because that's what they have available, but you could use any sort of matting, or uh, I use tarps, a couple of tarps uh, layered together on mine, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, oops, whoa. Uh, and they build, yeah, they have the infrastructure built up and then they just add the per perishable stuff. And then you can, you know, grow vining stuff on the back wall and quite a lot because these trellis roofs uh, can take, you know, strings attached to them so you can do tomatoes in the summer. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting variation on a greenhouse. If you're building a greenhouse and you're interested in turning it into a four season greenhouse, having that back wall, it's not like you're getting the sun through the northern wall anyway. Um, this is a really interesting, uh, adaptation that might not be significantly, depending on how handy you are, uh, how significantly more expensive. You could also build a greenhouse of that same configuration with the drums on the backside instead of the masonry. It would do the same thing. Um, so yeah, there's, again, this will be on the website so you can find these resources, but if you Google for a Chinese greenhouse, uh, the University of Minnesota actually has grants for growers to build them in, in, sorry, in Minnesota. So if, you're, if you happen to be a market gardener from Minnesota, you can check that out. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really cool uh, resources for that. So this is mine. Um, I built this a few years ago. This is a wallapini, which is an in-ground greenhouse. Mine's semi-in-ground. I had to dig it out to make it in the ground. But it is built of earth bags, which are uh, grain bags, spent grain bags from like uh, Hop House and Wisconsin Brewing Company uh, that I filled with a mixture of clay, straw, um, lime, and uh, wood chips, and then packed kind of like a retaining wall to go as to hold up the interior. So this is the trench where the wall would go. And then I, I built that all the way up, as you can see here. And here's the roof being put on. Um, and it is supposed to absorb the sunlight in the winter onto that back wall. And then it would be a four season greenhouse in the ground. I'd change the roof. I'd do some alterations on this, but, um, but here it is in the spring. And here it is, here's the back side of it with a thermal mass and windows there. Uh, because I got tired of doing. And so here is an unheated. So some winters I heat it, I'll show you how, and other winters I don't. So this is the temperature graph from uh, last year's February to this year's, or I guess last, so this is last winter, this is not this winter. So here is freezing about here. So it does dip below freezing, but it doesn't, here's 23 degrees. So it never got below 23 degrees. That was the coldest it got in there. That was with no heat, um, with no artificial heat. And I do cover it. I've got a rolling cover, uh, so it opens up to get some sun in the winter, and then it goes back down. Um, I do have a mass heater in there, um, so this is when it's running. Um, I, and I just burn scrap wood in there, so it's not like I'm buying in uh, wood to burn in there. And it doesn't burn much, I just keep it above freezing. Um, I even have like a, a sensor in there, as you can see, because I have the data, and it pings my phone. If it gets down to 36 degrees, I go out there, I start a fire, and it's fine for the night. Uh, even like even well below zero, it's perfectly fine. And I have and I would start these plants outside and then bring them in. Um, and I can start things in here really early. So uh, 
uh, a bit more infrastructure, but you know, this is just kind of case study, just to give you some ideas of what, what's out there. You can find a whole video with, I apologize, really annoying music uh, on, on YouTube or on our website, lowtechinstitute.org. I do apologize for the music, just t please turn it down. Um, you can see me almost lose an eye uh, plastering it. Okay, Orange is in Kansas. This is a really uh, neat guy, and he builds these greenhouses and sells kits and he grows citrus in, in, for sale in uh, Kansas. Um, and he digs these things deep into the ground and he sells kits called Greenhouse in the Snow. So you can Google Greenhouse in the Snow and they'll come up. Um, but uh, yeah, kits and sh you can build them however long you want, however big you want. Um, and yeah, so he's growing oranges and lemons all winter long, uh, really beautiful interior. Uh, you know, if you wanted to get something off the shelf, there's the shelf. Uh, the N, uh, New Alchemy Institute was uh, kind of like what I aspire to be. They had a whole bunch of researchers working in the 1970s on things like hydroponics and really ahead of their time agricultural research. Uh, this was like during the oil crisis uh, that I heard happened in the 70s. I wasn't there yet um, or aware of gas. Um, and so these are bio shelters that they designed and built. And so these are houses on the north side, and then on the southern side, they have large absorbent windows with a, basically a, a working ecosystem. They've got water uh, with fish and all kinds of plants and animals living in the water and grow beds, and they're all interconnected. Um, there's some really great videos uh, on YouTube um, that, uh, that you could check out that show them working. And so this is when they were being built in like the 70s, how they were getting installed, and this is one still functioning today. They built one on um, Prince Edward Island in Canada, and it was a passively heated uh, arc in, in PEI. Oh, here it is. Um, and this was like running just on solar heat in Prince Edward Island, which isn't the coldest part of Canada, but it's still plenty cold. Um, so yeah, so you can check that out, Cape Cod Arc. Um, you can't see the video, it didn't capture when I tried to screen grab it, but if you go to Cape Cod Arc on YouTube, there's a, a, a walkthrough of it, it's really cool. Um, yeah, and this is the compost greenhouse. This was actually the inspiration for a compost study that I did this last year. Um, it is a greenhouse with bays for horse manure in the back, and then there's blowers. Uh, it's an aerated static pile, so you never have to turn this compost, it blows uh, fresh air through the compost and or through the horse manure and compost it without any turning and then it takes the carbon dioxide heat and moisture and pushes it into grow beds to make the grow beds warm uh, yeah really uh, great and so what I tried to do with my study uh, was to make this modular so market gardeners could put it in in the winter and then take it out uh, unfortunately I think you don't have enough control over the variables you need to build a custom built one but it's pretty cool um, if you have access to horse manure, go for it. Um, yeah, so here it is from the side. You can see the horse manure. There's a blower to blow CO2. The plants love the CO2. And then the heat rises up into this bed. The heat gets blown into this bed. And then the, um, the H2O, the CO2, get blown through corrugated uh, tube up through a wood chip bed, which has a lot of beneficial bacteria to convert all the any uh, nitrites uh, into nitrates or the vice versa. Uh, and then it goes into the plants. Uh, yeah, it's really clever. And they got tons of uh, winter vegetable, uh, winter leafy greens. They were actually getting growth put on um, in that, uh, but most people can't expect that. So this is what we built. This was a bladder that would capture all that moisture and send it through a grow bed, but it wasn't working. I did get good compost. I have tons of good compost out of this, but this was our bladder system that we built. But I'm not gonna get too deep into it because it was a negative, uh, or negative results are still results. All right, so that's the end of what I have, uh, but I'm very happy to entertain questions or comments what's been working for you uh, growing in the winter. So thank you very much. All right, any questions? Yes? That's true. Horses have, uh, yeah, horses have uh, less complete digestion, and so yeah, there you do get more pass-through of seeds and things like that, but there's more to compost. Uh, they compost really well because it has a lot more, uh, let me refer, so you want, for composting, you want a 30 to one or 25 to one nitrogen to carbon ratio, right? Horse manure with bedding is almost perfect. It's, it's 25 to one as you scoop it out of the stable, and so you can throw it right in the bin. It's really, it's really nice that way. If, you're, if it's straw bedding, as, as if it's wood chip bedding, it's a little off. But horse man, or cow manure, then you have to add a lot of nitrogen to it. Excuse me, you have to add a lot of carbon to it because it's more nitrogen concentrated. So perfectly fine to use horse manure or uh, cow manure. Basically, whatever you have access to is what you should use. Um, 
Yeah, there's handouts up here if you want to grab any on the way out. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, other questions? This folks are. Yeah. So, good question. Uh, let the soil itself be your guide. The question was, how often should you be watering in the winter? And it's really dependent because the weather's more variable and the water needs are more variable in the winter. So, use your fingers uh, into the soil and see, is it damp? You can probably wait. If it's dry, water. Yeah, that's basically it. Especially, uh, again, do it on a warm, sunny, nice day. Yeah, other questions? All the ground. No, you're fine, you're fine. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you duck. Yeah. We're talking, you know, when you're growing. Yeah. The, you said the bed, you're talking soil temperature, not as covered. Right, so the bed temperature, yeah. You, preferably you keep your soil from freezing. Yeah. Right, because then it can t continue uh, biological activity. Frozen, some plants can survive with frozen ground, but if you can keep it from freezing, that's, idea, that's better. Um, yeah, but uh, a lot of plants can deal with cold air temperatures, but if their roots freeze, they die. But if their air temp, yeah, like cabbage is fine with the ground, if the air freezes, yeah. Yeah, sorry, question back there. No, oh, negative 20 night? Uh, depends, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're gonna have to experiment what works for your place. Uh, for me, for me to get through negative 20, and are we talking just like at night it's negative 20 then it warms up or are we talking like three days negative 20 because these are all different things. It's all so variable. But you know, the, the more mulch, if, if it's gonna be really cold, I might like shovel snow on top of it because that's insulative too. You know, like, and usually there's snow there when it's negative 20 uh, and I would shovel it on if it's light snow or maybe I would get some, uh, you know, extra tarps and put it over it, just anything to keep, or spread straw over it and then cover it. I mean, whatever you can do. But then I forgot to mention straw and other mulches also can harbor uh, mice and things like that. So you might even think about mouse, mouse traps because I've certainly had mouse eaten cabbage and stuff like that. And then I put mouse traps in there. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Other question, comments, concerns. Yeah. Just mouse traps usually or garter snakes. I'm just kidding. They don't. They, they don't live in the winter. But yeah, mouse. I, I'm not against using. Uh, you know, some people will put out the pellets that they eat. That that works perfectly fine. I use the mouse traps because I like to feed the mice to my chickens. Whoa. Same thing. Uh, traps. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, pellets. I will use. I, if it, if it's getting real bad, I'll use chemicals. But I try not to. Peanut butter is what I usually use. I haven't had to trap for voles. Uh, but I know other people use mouse traps and vole traps with a lot of success. But yeah, for me, for mice, it's always peanut butter because it sticks on there, it works real well for me. Straw bales, uh-huh. Voles love straw. It's a, yeah, I like straw for my potatoes, but then the voles get in it and they destroy my potatoes. So the potatoes produce tubers, but then the, my, the voles eat them, so. All right, thanks guys. And that's where we wrapped up. Next time we'll be back in Cooksville in the year 2100 looking at compressed air. Stay tuned. That's it for this week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. This show is hosted and produced by me, Scott Johnson. The episode was recorded in the Low Tech recording booth in Cooksville, Wisconsin. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you enjoyed the free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. Thanks to our Forester and Land Steward level members, the Hanvises, for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute membership and underwriting at, of course, lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media. You can reach me directly. I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was First Snow off the album Winter Lo-Fi from Holisna. That song is in the public domain, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons Attribution and Share Alike license, meaning you're free to use it and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks so much for listening, and take care. <laughs>